You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast produced by Veteran Strategies and featuring conversations with fascinating and impactful men and women who have shaped our world, our communities, and our history. My name is Robert Vane, Principal of Veteran Strategies, and your host for our discussion. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel, Grand Hall, and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. You can find all your sales and rental equipment needs at McAllister.com. We're pleased to announce our podcast is now a member of the All Indiana Podcast Network in partnership with Wish TV. You can find Leaders and Legends at AllIndianaPodcastNetwork.com. Thank you for joining us on the Leaders and Legends podcast. Our guest today is Harold Holzer. We had him on a few weeks ago to talk about his book, The Presidents Versus the Press. He has very graciously agreed to come back on and have a discussion about Abraham Lincoln. And let's make one thing clear. There is nobody walking the earth today who knows more about Abraham Lincoln, his ascendancy to the presidency, his time in office, his impact on our culture and our history than Harold Holzer. Harold, thank you very much. Thank you for having me back so quickly. Well, you know, just I'm going to read before we get into the interview, I am going to read some of these uh, titles of yours and then I'll post it on the podcast website. Okay. Lincoln and the power of the press, the war for public opinion, a just and generous nation, President Lincoln Assassinated, Exploring Lincoln, which I've read and is terrific, Lincoln, How Abraham Lincoln Ended Slavery in America, Emancipating Lincoln, The Proclamation in Text, Context, and Memory, 1863, Lincoln's Pivotal Year, and it goes on and on. And especially a very good one is Lincoln, President-Elect. Harold Holzer has written these books, contributed many articles, uh, spoke at many, many forums, been on C-SPAN, the list goes on and on, and was an was a historical advisor to the movie Lincoln, which is absolutely terrific and should have won the Oscar for Best Picture, although Argo was pretty good, I have to admit. Harold, thank you for coming on the podcast. You've done the whole politics of the Oscars, too. <laughs> oh, well, we you know what? We can talk about that. I well, got it from the horse's mouth. That. Well, once Saving Private Ryan didn't win the Best Picture Oscar, I have never watched the Oscars since. The Academy does not like my friend Steven Spielberg. He's too successful, too rich, too talented. And it's it was ever thus. It's just very strange. Shakespeare in Love is an eminently forgettable, cute movie. And I don't know a single person who has seen Saving Private Ryan and does not have it on its top, on its Mount Rushmore of the history's war. I didn't realize it was the same year as uh, Shakespeare in Love, which you're right, was cute. This podcast, and I refuse, the fact that the Oscars are left of Khrushchev doesn't make any difference to me. I could care less. You get used to that. Well, Stephen is pretty left. Uh, The the, the X factor in all these things is Harvey Weinstein, the uh, lamented Harvey Weinstein. (laughs) He pushes the voters the way the studios used to. Okay, yeah, that's not what you want to talk about. No, but no, I'm happy to have you on the podcast. We can talk about whatever you want. Uh, but to, to get an hour with you to talk about Abraham Lincoln is a, is a true treasure. And the podcast originates here in Indianapolis, Indiana. And we Hoosiers have an exalted, and I would say somewhat exaggerated sense of our contribution to Abraham Lincoln's upbringing and the formation of his political views. Uh, we're not Kentucky, we're not Illinois, but we're right in the middle. And Lincoln's time in Indiana was impactful. As a man who has studied the 16th president, how would you describe his time as a Hoosier, what it meant to him? Well, it was his family. I mean, you're absolutely right to, I wouldn't say boast or gloat, but refer to it. Um, he spent more time in Indiana than he did in Kentucky, of course. And then with the years of his 
maturing as a as a young man, as a boy from a boy to a young man. Um, and um, he, um, you know, Indianapolis is the place he visited as the first stop on his inaugural journey. I'm sure we'll talk about his transition to president-elect, pretty timely subject these days in America, transitions. And, um, you know, he remained close to people in Indiana. And of course, I think very um, emotionally connected. When he wrote the uh, his great foray into poetry, into lyric poetry, My Childhood Home I See Again, and the, and the Bear Hunt, which some people think is one poem that got separated out as two because he published part of it. It's pretty dark, um, that poem. It's, it's about, um, it's about the, his experience in Indiana. It's about the losses. Um, he not only began his education in Indiana, but he lost his mother. And uh, you know, a large part of his emotional life uh, ended in Indiana because of that tragedy. So it's complicated. Um, but he never wrote about any state more than he wrote about Indiana. Just read that poem. It's long. My childhood home, I see again and gladden with the view. And then he goes on. Then he goes dark. How did his time in Indiana influence and affect his views on slavery? Well, in parts of Indiana, you could see uh, enslaved people. Uh, you're close enough to borders to see slaves being marched along the so-called federal roads in those days. So, you know, it's, it's not a matter of Indiana being any more repressive. It was less so than Kentucky after a time. But uh, this, the Southern Indiana culture was certainly pro-slavery. And it, it's almost as much a matter of geography as, a matter, as, it, as it is a matter of emotional and intellectual development. Lincoln is just growing up into an adolescent um, in his Indiana days. And I think it just has develops, as all kids do, more cognizance of his surroundings and uh, listens perhaps more attentively at church than he did in Kentucky and um, learns, learns uh, at Baptist church what, what anti-slavery means in terms of biblical uh, uh, warnings about oppressing other people. How old was Lincoln when he moved to Indiana? Oh, you sound like my friend Brian Lamb uh, from Lafayette. That's great. Hey, another Hoosier. He is a he is a Hoosier. Um, let's see. He was born in 1809. Spent 11 years in Indiana, but I don't think he gets there in about 1816 when he's seven. So, 16 to 27 would be my guess before they move into Coles County. Also, to your point earlier, just a few seconds ago, those are formative years. Yeah, exactly. It's, you know, um, it grows from a boy to a man, really. And and because of his, you know, early and um, dramatic physical growth, you know, he's a six footer when he's about 14 or 15 years old. Um, it's amazing when kids shoot up. My 13 year old grandson, who has been really almost exclusively indoors for eight months, uh, with his mom ignoring warnings that it's really bad to be deprived of sunlight and vitamin D. <laughs> it's almost worse than being exposed to COVID. It's a worse risk. He's shot up about five inches or more in the last six months. So it's dramatic. He's as tall as I am now, which is not that tall, but still impressive. <laughs> well, you know, my... My son's six foot seven. And so he, uh, is he really? Yeah. And I was five foot tall till I was 17 and then I'm six one now. So if you, there was six, a, seven, you have to have the ceilings raised, <laughs> you know, he's, uh, I will just say that he, and then my other son who served a couple of tours in Afghanistan, he's six foot four at least. So, you know, maybe I was dropped on my head. I have any idea. I well, you have a very it. tall spouse. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything? That, by the way, Go they ahead. say that Nancy Lincoln was tall, and it's not so much that his father was tall, but that Nancy was like a good five eleven, which is wow. tall for a woman. 
you know, 5'10", 5'11". And that the height comes from the Hanks side. But, but well, Lincoln's father was. But Robert Lincoln wasn't that tall, was he? Abraham's son? You know, they said of him in, in Springfield, he's all Todd. And they didn't mean it as a compliment. <laughs> but they didn't. Um, is there anything in Lincoln's formative years, let's say till he's 18, 21, <laughs> that would ever make you think, not only will this guy become president and perhaps our greatest president, that, but that he would be a success at all? Um, I think there are indications that he was different, kind of countercultural, that he was set apart. There were things he, I mean, he didn't like hunting. He didn't like farming. I mean, he was compelled to farm because his father needed him. But um, I, I'm fascinated by the thing about hunting. My friend David Reynolds has just published a new book called Abe, um, a name he didn't like, that sets him in the culture of his various environments. Um, and he writes a lot about the Indiana years and how, how Lincoln was just did not join the boys in some of the activities that marked uh, maturation, including his earliest wrestling matches. He tells this interesting stories that, that um, the, the most successful wrestlers of the period were people who gouged people's eyes out. <laughs> and some people wore eyeball earrings as like a macho um, demonstration. It's pretty repulsive. But that he was like, he was unusually fair. You know, he, he attacked people below the eyes and above the belt, which was unusual. He didn't like shooting game for sport. Um, just thinking all the time. And I, I don't think he loved the environment in Indiana. Not the forest primeval that he writes about in uh, My Childhood Home. He writes, you know, we were like Gray's elegy in a country churchyard. We, it was just, our life was the short and simple annals no, of the, the poor. poor. <laughs> um, but it made an impression, even if it was something he wanted to escape. Not the Indiana you know today, but the, the um, you know, the prairie, the, uh, the forest. He said wild animals, wild bears. He didn't much like it. He wasn't romantic about it. He was not as romantic about those log cabins as his admirers became in later years. About what you mentioned, David Reynolds. Is that the David Reynolds who wrote the book about Churchill's uh, World War II histories? No. Um, it's the David Reynolds who's written books about Walt Whitman uh, and John Brown. Okay. Um, when did Lincoln start to get the, the pull, feel the pull of politics to be not run for office? Cause I know that's later, but just to be interested in it and, and to become literate enough to understand it and be a part of the discussion. So I think that dates to his, um, well, even in late years in Indiana, since we're being very Hoosier oriented here, teenage years, um, his stepmother testified to the fact that he, uh, in addition to the reading that is most often romanticized, you know, he read Shakespeare, his stepmother brought a Bible to the house, so he began reading scripture, but he also read newspapers. He read the St. Louis Democrat, which was an anti-democratic newspaper, very complicated. But then there was the St. Louis Republican, which was a democratic newspaper, just to make things really confusing. But he read the St. Louis anti-Jackson paper when he was a young man. And he would read it by the firelight and just, you know, they weren't tabloids. They weren't even broadsheets as we know them. They were big papers, you know, lots of, lots of ink, no pictures. And I think that's what stimulated his uh, interest in politics. As a teenager, um, he wrote an article for the press. Um, well, his neighbor, uh, who I think was a minister, if I'm not mistaken, helped him get it published. And it was a temperance editorial. Um, he saw enough people on the prairie who drank, you know, people drank, you know, seven gallons of whiskey a year in those days. They just bought jugs and kept them. 
Uh, his father didn't drink and Lincoln didn't, didn't like drinking. Uh, so he was reading, I think his political education begins with the newspapers. And uh, then when he moves on to New Salem as, at the age of 22, not 21, uh, as most, when most kids emancipated, um, he finally enters a community where there are, there are people who care about lectures and reading and there's a, a, a mentor in town whose name is Mentor Graham. I never figured out whether his name was Mentor <laughs> or they just called him Mentor Graham because he was everybody's mentor. Like, no like, a, like Parson Pendleton? Exactly, or Squire Brown, yeah. <laughs> uh, or Reverend whatever. Um, mentor Graham lent him books and it was in Springfield that um, that he runs for, I'm sorry, New Salem, that he runs for the state legislature, loses even before he becomes a lawyer. So he's into it in his 20s. And I'll tell you, I don't mean to say this, especially um, to a veteran and ha happy Veterans Day. Thank you, Harold. And thank you for your service, um, your sons and uh, everybody who has served. Um, Lincoln famously had his only military experience in um, the Black Hawk War. I, I think there's a possibility that he enlisted in the Black Hawk War knowing that he had no chance to be in politics if he did not volunteer and see some service. It was just part of the game. Um, Much like his son at the, end of World, at the end of the Civil War coming out of Harvard. Absolutely. Absolutely. Robert, that's a great point. Because Robert said to him when he got his cushy assignment for the last three months of the Civil War, he said, how can, what am I going to say to people later when they, when they ask me what I did during the war, Daddy? Right? That was a play or a movie or something. What did I do in the war, Daddy? And so he got, yeah, I think Lincoln felt that. Although he, you know, his service was over and he was elected captain, as I'm sure you know. Mm -hmm. And then um, his company disbanded. He didn't return. He actually served, he hit, he served, signed up for another hitch, another short hitch um, as a private. He was, you know, demoted because he lost his unit. He had to join <laughs> another unit. But then there was the other thing that's animating Lincoln, and that is abject poverty. If he served another little session, a little stint, he gets some free land as a bonus. So I think politics and poverty or motivating him into the war a little bit. It's pretty well known that Lincoln's political hero was Henry Clay. Uh, my political hero is Andrew Jackson. They really? seem to have, oh yeah, they seem to. I mean, you know, he 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 could have behaved a little better, uh, but I think Jackson's uh, Jackson's effect on on both small D and capital D democracy is is tremendous. Um, you must be a populist because he sure was. Well, I just think that Jackson's a man of action and that, and that as a man of action and a man of a, a true leader, especially during the nullification crisis, when he said, I'll just shoot Henry Clay or hang John C. Calhoun, people would be like, yeah, you will. Uh, that's a, it's a, that's kind of a frontier way to put it, but yeah. his Jackson's stance during nullification was exactly what was needed to face down the nullifiers I'll give you a question you'll like. Okay, one man in American history won uh, the popular vote four times, and that's obviously Franklin D. Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. But three candidates won the popular vote three times. Who are they? They won the popular vote three times as a presidential candidate? Yes, I wouldn't be that tricky and do it as, as mayor of Sheboygan. No, as a presidential <laughs> candidate. Um, well, it's not Grover Cleveland. Yes, it is. That's one. Is, is he one? He Pretty won. Darn it. good. That's okay. a tough one. The other one you should get in a second. Oh, well, Jackson's Andrew the other. Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson. Because mm -hmm. he won against John Quincy Adams. It's just that Adams won the electoral vote. And then the next two, Jackson won. So a, a very corrupt bargain. I don't care what bargain. I don't care what Jeannie and David Heidler say. <laughs> it is corrupt. But well, you got to be careful about going against the will of the people, don't you? They certainly do, especially when you're John Quincy Adams, who couldn't have been less representative of. I the was American thinking people. more contemporaneously, but that's okay. I'm sure. Uh, but why was Henry Clay 
besides the fact that he was from Kentucky as Lincoln was, why was Henry Clay Abraham Lincoln's political hero? Because I think very much unlike Andrew Jackson, I mean, Lincoln disliked uh, Jackson for two, why does he become, I've often wondered, I mean, why does a guy who is from the frontier, why does he become an anti-Jackson man? And the, and the answers are that Jackson yeah. doesn't really believe in federalism, doesn't believe in, in infrastructure, doesn't believe in, in finan- government interference with financial institutions, which Lincoln believes in, which is why he becomes a Whig. But the other thing that about Jackson and Jacksonian democracy that Lincoln dislikes is the kind of rabble aspect of it, the very thing that you like, right? He doesn't like crowds swarming into the White House and snipping off pieces of the drapes for souvenirs. Ironically, they would do exactly the same thing during <laughs> about, Lincoln's time. It's about to and make Lincoln, that point. Because <laughs> Lincoln uh, uh, um, stimulated a cult of personality as well, from sort of in the same, with the same ardor and also on the other side, the same hatred as Jackson did. So um, Henry Clay is, you know, did not <clears throat> earn the title of great compromiser for nothing. He was a person who reached um, across factions, got people together to do to compromise, um, and had a much uh, calmer impact. He also was a, a speech maker who avoided um, great flourishes and romanticized um, drama. Uh, and Lincoln, you know, really based his own rhetorical development on that Clay model. I think in his eulogy of Henry Clay, he kind of a little bit exaggerated that aspect of Clay, but he believed it. Uh, so Clay was his hero from, you know, the late 1840s on. And, and you know, people often say, why did he, why of all the women that he could have married, did he marry Mary Todd? And listen, if you, if you, and you're, you know, 30 years old, and it's time to get married. If you meet a girl who knew your hero, and had, you know, had him at your house, um, I think that's a pretty intoxicating thing for Lincoln. I always think that that's part of the courtship story we don't hear. Mary says, oh, my dad knows Henry Clay, and Lincoln proposes. (laughs) I also say that that Lincoln and Jackson were probably the two most vilified presidents until you get FDR took some abuses, but certainly in the first hundred, 150 years of the Republic, no two presidents I agree. were personally attacked the way Andrew Jackson and Abraham Lincoln were. And they were the first two, well, Washington to a tiny degree, but it was at such a formative period that there were no real rules and traditions, but Jackson and Lincoln both have to put down secession crises, don't they? Because people just are so suspicious and angry that they just decide it's better to be apart. And Jackson, of course, doesn't stand for it either. And you've alluded to this a little bit. So let me ask this question real quick. Lincoln, um, is it Rousseau? Who is it? Aristotle? Man is a political animal. I forget who said that. It's one of the two, I think. Uh, but Lincoln seemed always to be, once he reached his adulthood and started to have a greater awareness beyond just his immediate uh, sort of parochial surroundings, um, to be a political animal. And did that surprise you when you first started your reading and your research? And do you think that's one of the things that's most surprising to people is that is that the, the hagiographical hey, sort of deification of Lincoln is in some ways justified, but there is a, there's a burning, ambitious political human being uh, at the core of himself. You know, I don't think his ambition has anything to do with the, the reduction of the hero worship aspect of it. I think it's more about contemporary interpretations of the things he said about race um, that don't meet the standards of um, 2020. Um, but that's a whole other story. No, I agree. I, I wasn't surprised when I found it out. Um, I mean, my introduction to him as a kid, like many kids, is that he's, you know, he was assassinated and deified. And the assassination story pulls a lot of kids in, or did in my day, to the story. But, um, I mean, one of the, I've already promoted David Reynolds' book, but he argues that Lincoln is more than a politician, that he's someone who is existing within 
a culture of uh, literature and drama and violence and as a product of his culture. I think Lincoln exists primarily in the political milieu for sure. Um, and, um, and he loved it. He, I mean, here's a guy who practiced law so he could live. But every weekend when most of his lawyer, fellow lawyers on the judicial circuit went home to see their families, Lincoln stayed. And I don't think he stayed out on the, you know, the hustings because he didn't like Mary, because even if he didn't like Mary, he liked his boys. So he would want to go home. I think he stayed because there was another politician or editor to see so that he could depend on their loyalty wherever his ambition took him. Um, when, so did the, when did the notion of running for president congeal in his mind? Was it, was it more after he lost? Is it 1858? That's the Senate race with Douglas. Did I get that right? So is it post-Douglas loss in the Senate or was it even before then? You know, he never, the only time he ever said anything is not long before the convention in 1860 when he said that he admitted the taste is in my mouth a little. Um, it just didn't, you know, Victorian dudes didn't say they were cravenly aspiring to higher office. But look, remember in 1856, he was a candidate or at least an, um, nominated uh, he didn't win the nomination, but his name was put in nomination for vice president by the first uh, Republican ticket. Uh, there's a great parallel 100 years later. John F. Kennedy's name is put in nomination. That's right. As vice president in 1956. And he sure gets the idea fast when he loses to Estes Kefauver that he's never going to let Stevenson get the nomination a third term. He's going to go after it, even though he has to run for re-election to the Senate. He hasn't even been re-elected. Of course, Barack Obama was only a one term. So, you know, it changes. Media helps you change. But I think, you know, from 56 on, he thinks of himself as a national figure. During the Lincoln-Douglas debates, he knows. Now, I, I do not believe, as some scholars do, that his Freeport doctrine, where he pushes Douglas into a corner, right. pushes him into saying, um, Yes, if a Southern territory says, I don't want slavery, then slavery should be illegal in that Southern area. And thereupon, Douglas's Southern support blew up. He could never be the nominee of a United Democratic Party, and he wasn't. I don't believe Lincoln calculated that to, to lose the Senate election, but come back two years later as, as president. I think he wanted to be a senator in 58. But um, he goes to Cooper Union in February 1860 mm -hmm. to speak. That's a launching pad for him in the East. Um, so I think it's on his mind uh, and uh, before he admits it. So I would say from, um, I date it to the day, I put this in my book, Lincoln and Cooper Union. In December of 1859, November, but well, wait, October, gotta get this right. October of 59, he's been campaigning in Ohio, and Wisconsin for Republicans. Um, and he's in a law case and has just won a law case. And he gets there at a party having oysters. And he gets the news that Republicans have won in Wisconsin and Ohio and Pennsylvania. It's a great night for Republicans in the for gubernatorial races. And I think he gets the idea. He goes home on a train. He opens his mail and he gets an invitation that's waiting for him, a telegram to speak in New York City at Cooper Union, actually to speak in Brooklyn as the invitation first specified. So I think he must think about it then. He's campaigned for Republicans who've won. He's now invited to New York where Seward is the favorite son to undercut him. He may, know, he may think it's a long shot, but he decides on a strategy to be everybody's second choice. And boy, that pays off brilliantly. I mean, if Seward got a few more votes, he would have been the nominee. That's but right. Uh, I forget who wrote the biography of Seward I read. It's really good. It's, Walter like, Starr. It was terrific. What a terrific. Is that, is that the one, the new one by Walter Starr? Uh, I think so. I think so. Seward just comes off as, as so incredibly wise, both in his, his, his 
intrinsic brain power, but the slow evolution to where he says the president is the best of is the greatest of us all or something to that effect. Yeah. Well, he wasn't very wise in 1859 when he decided the best way to show that he's the front runner is to take a grand tour of Europe. That wasn't too much. And he wasn't very <laughs> wise between Fort Sumter and Bull Run when he decided to stage like a, an unofficial coup d'etat by planting anti-Lincoln editorials in the New York Times, wanted a policy, <laughs> wanted leader. Lincoln, Lincoln scribbled on them. I've seen this, I've held this clip in my, well, I, the page from the Lincoln papers. He wrote in pencil villainous editorials and filed them. Um, but once he turned Seward, told Seward who the boss was, so for the next four years, there was absolute loyalty. Lincoln, is it fair to say, both at the convention, Chicago, was that where the convention was? Chicago, yeah. 1860, the Republican convention, both at the convention and in the subsequent presidential election in November, Lincoln benefited significantly from the fact that there were so many people clamoring, A, for the nomination, and B, for election. How do you feel... Or, or refute me, please. How do you feel that this multi-candidate sort of contest twice helped him achieve his goal? Well, there are always multi-candidates in a convention. This is It's an interesting theory. But if he's lurking as number second place and Seward is going down over the first two or three ballots, uh, you have a point. There are a lot of aspirants and Lincoln is uh, out there as an alternative, not as radical as Seward, according to perceptions, or of Chase, not as conservative as Bates. So he's got, he's the perfect guy in the perfect place. Another Hoosier, Edward Bates. Another Hoosier. Um, um, not the wisest idea. He would have been really old as a candidate in those days. I think he was Harrison's age, you know, near 70. Well, but and Lincoln think, and also had not created as many enemies. I mean, Chase had multiple enemies. Seward seemed yeah, to revel in the fact that created... You know, he had enough enemies out in the body politic so that the minute he was elected, seven states started the process of seceding. So he was unpopular in the South, to be sure. Bates would have been more accepted because he would, had been a slave owner, for one thing. Um, as for the multi-person field, um, I had a, uh, I was good friends with a historian named William Gnapp, who died much too young. Um, his wife has recently completed his version of Gideon Wells' Civil War Diary, by the way. Um, anyway, Bill was a statistical historian. He was the first one, really, in this trend of people who really crunch numbers to look at elections and history. And he looked at county by county in states like Indiana, Illinois, New York, and said that if you combine all the votes in key counties, the three people who ran against Lincoln, Lincoln would have still won enough votes to give him the states and that he would have won the electoral votes anyway, even against one opponent. Okay, so that's one way of looking at it. But the other way of looking at it is, I've been a political press secretary in multi-candidate fields. There's a dynamic there that is, goes beyond statistics. So I think Lincoln does benefit enormously from the, that's a long-winded way of saying I agree with you. He benefits as being the only Republican in a race with two Democrats and one something else. As he said, the the presidential grub gets a gnawing and it's, <laughs> it's hard for someone to say no. Well, he said that about uh, Salmon Chase. Yeah, that's right. In 1864. What's the most overrated thing about Abraham Lincoln? Uh, well, that's a good question. Well, I guess that he was um, determined from his days in, in, uh, as a flatboatsman visiting New Orleans that he devoted his life to eradicating slavery. I think that's not the case. I think he was genuinely anti-slavery. And we can believe him when he wrote to Horace Greeley that, that uh He's always been that he had always been a, never felt there was never a moment when he didn't feel that way. But I don't think his major goal in life was 
to eradicate slavery. So maybe that's overrated. I, I think he deserves his ratings for character and his writing ability is, is you know, the best of any American president. Um, uh, so I'm, I don't think he's overrated generally. I think he's becoming <laughs> underrated generally. Well, I was just so you. Cynicism of today is brutal. Completely and totally agree. One hundred percent on the money. Uh, so let me follow up. What's the most underrated thing about Abraham Lincoln? I think his literary ability. I'm with Edmund Wilson, um, whom I don't agree with on much else about Lincoln, but he said it is possible to imagine Lincoln as a great writer of a a non-political kind, and that he's the only president who would qualify as a great author of literature. And um, second inaugural and uh, the Gettysburg Address and parts of his 1861 message to Congress and his 1862 message of Congress uh, and his first inaugural. Uh, and, and by the way, our, our literature and is there ever a better lesson as everyone is in a state of confusion and hysteria and anger um, to remember Lincoln's admonition in his first inaugural when he's pushing back against states and leaders who won't accept his election. And remember, he got 39.9% of the vote. He said, why should, there not, why should there not be a patient confidence in the ultimate justice of the people? Is there any finer hope in the world? I think that's still a very good lesson for us. Is it possible that the Gettysburg Address is not his best speech? Yeah, I mean, I'm a Gettysburg Address man, especially this time of year. We're speaking in, you and I are speaking in mid-November. Um, this is the time that I would have for the last 24 years been in my car driving to Gettysburg for the annual Lincoln Forum, which takes place November 16th to 18th at Gettysburg. We have great speakers, we have banquets, battlefield tours, breakout sessions, book sales, prizes. Uh, and we're now doing it remotely on Saturday, November 14th, uh, a one day uh, online Lincoln Forum, which is sad. It's our silver anniversary, um, although we will be back stronger, we hope next year. But um, yeah, I think the Gettysburg Address is sublime um, from start to finish. And maybe the every other paragraph but the first section of the second inaugural. If you ask Lincoln, he might have said the second inaugural. Um, he got a letter from William Seward's political mentor, Thurlow. Thurlow. Yeah. after the second inaugural, saying, I want to compliment you on the little speech you gave when you accepted your nomination. Why he would write about that when it was back in June, you know, it was almost a year before. And I think that's what he meant. But Lincoln interpreted it as praise for his second inaugural. And he said, I think it will wear as well or better than anything I have ever written. But it is not immediately popular. People do not like being told that they're not doing God's work. And um, so if you ask Lincoln, it was the second inaugural. To the, my favorite reaction to Lincoln's second inaugural, and please tell the story, is the reaction of Frederick Douglass. So Frederick Douglass um, watches it. It's a very integrated crowd, first really integrated crowd, lots of... Uh, uh, U.S. colored troops were there in the audience. And Lincoln has a reception back at the White House, not the inaugural ball, but a reception. And Frederick Douglass somehow kind of fails to talk his way in, but he kind of goes in through a window. And then the guards stop him, and Lincoln sees him from a distance and says, there is my friend Douglass to a white crowd. There is my, that's the momentous words of the day, almost as important as the second inaugural. There is my friend Douglas. There is no one whose opinion I respect more than yours. What did you think? And then enough about you now, what about me? What did you think of my inaugural address? And Douglas says, Mr. Lincoln, it's a sacred effort. And 
Lincoln wanted to talk more, but Douglas moved moved on down a lot. And by the way, what he liked, he later wrote, was not with malice toward none, with charity for all. What he liked was if every drop of blood, uh, every drop of blood, um, um, what is the word, drawn with a lash shall be repaid by one drawn with a sword, as it was said 3,000 years ago, so let it be said today, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Or as Daniel Day Lewis said, true and righteous altogether. <laughs> that was Frederick Douglass's favorite part, that long, long sentence. Is it fair to say Lincoln is the most quoted American president? Yeah, misquoted too. But absolutely. Look at how many times have we heard about the better angels of our nature in the last three weeks? Um, Barack Obama used that that whole section of the first inaugural when he gave his victory speech in uh, Lincoln Park, right? In Chicago, 12 years ago, in 2008. Um, uh, yes, I, I've looked at, I've, I've studied this. I did a, a, a book with Mario Cuomo once called Why Lincoln Matters, um, which had a lot of uses of presidents using Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt, Taft, Wilson, FDR for sure, sort of stole him for the Democratic Party. Stevenson, Eisenhower, I mean, you just all of everyone. Um, Jefferson is a distant, distant second in, uh, in quotability. And, and because they are, his, his sentiments are not limited to their time and place. They're universal and they're timeless. In absolute terms, how would you grade Jefferson Davis's performance as president of the Confederacy? And does his performance get just eviscerated because of the performance of Abraham Lincoln? Well, I'm biased, you know, sectionally and politically and historically. So, but I will try to give an unbiased reputation. Uh, Lincoln was always going to be the better writer and the better communicator. He was simply more gifted. Um, and there's a great uh, f- sort of a seminal scholarly article by James McPherson called How Lincoln Won the War of Metaphors Against Jefferson Davis. He could be soaring and he could use animal metaphors and simple farm metaphors. Um, sugar-coated is a famous phrase he used at the start of the war. The rebels are using are talking about rebellion and they're sugarcoating it. Um, he was understandable and he was inspiring. Davis was never gonna be a great communicator. Lincoln was a brilliant politician. He knew how to handle factions. He knew how to be devious. He knew how to be a leader. And remember presidents didn't tell Congress what to do in those days, um, but he managed and he managed to create a Supreme Court that would validate his um, the draft, the, or at least not deal with the draft and the emancipation. And he did it very gently. He didn't do a kind of um, um, philosophical sweep of the courts that we see today when every president uh, comes into office. So those are the things you expect Lincoln to be better at. And, and Davis was terrible with the Confederate founders. And they were terrible to him and with him. But Jefferson Davis was trained in military leadership. Right, he was a cavalry right. commander in the Mexican-American War. He was Secretary of War. He built the Soldiers' Retirement Home where Lincoln wound up spending three summers. Um, talk about poetic <laughs> justice. Davis should have outmaneuvered him as a commander in chief. Instead, you know, many of his major early generals despised him. Lee just tolerated him, and Lincoln, who had to borrow a book from the Library of Congress, uh, you know, including. Um, Henry Halleck's book on military strategy. He later used and got rid of Henry Halleck. Um, He had to teach himself. He understood joint command, uh, you know, joint action. He understood simultaneous attacks uh, earlier than Jefferson Davis. So he became a, not only a political genius as Doris Goodwin tells us, but I think he became a military genius. And I think McPherson agrees with me on the land front. And Craig Simons, my, my buddy, agrees with me on the, about the brown and uh, blue waters. 
uh, he starts out by saying, I don't know much about ships. And he manages to build the biggest Navy in the history of the world, hire the right people uh, to, to manage the Navy, uh, work uh, and, and in both sides of the war, embrace new technologies uh, like nobody's business, whether it was, uh, you know, um, ordnance on the army side or ironclads. If he hadn't made the big decision to green light the monitor, the war might have had a different result. So that's the part of leadership that I am, I, I've always been stunned by, that he was able, he was able to rise to that demand. Critique the following sentence, please. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. Um, I would say uh, I grew up that way, thinking that it's been pounded back against entirely too much. He did more than any other American to end slavery. Uh, whatever, uh, however woke we're becoming to the work of the abolitionists uh, and to African Americans in their own agency in and their own agency in leaving slavery when it was highly dangerous. Abraham Lincoln signed the paper, man. I mean, he signed it. He risked, he took the political risk during an off-year election. He said when he signed the final in January 63, if my name ever goes into history, it'll be for this act. And my whole soul is behind it. Um, I think, um, I mean, we don't like to say freed the slaves because it's politically incorrect. Abraham Lincoln ended slavery. I think I could live with that. I know I'm getting I'm in a minority these days, but I could live with that. Well, is there any any evidence or any instance of a successful servile rebellion prior to what Lincoln did through the power not only of the presidency but through the power of the armies of the north? A servile rebellion? You mean out of in some in other words, is there is there a, a factual historical evidence, pieces of evidence to support the claim that Lincoln wasn't dispositive in ending slavery because it was being ended through organic means? Yeah, it could never have been ended through organic means because when, I mean, it was advanced by organic means. It was advanced by abandonment of servitude by people who were rushing into union lines. But the Union Army needed the political uh, certitude, the, the legal uh, certitude to accept people and to make permanent their escape uh, and then to spread the word of liberation to places they hadn't gone to yet. So um, there could have been years and decades of squabbling and insurrections somewhere between John Brown and Haiti. If you don't have the Union Army fighting for you, um, fighting for your liberation, it's quite a different story. So yeah, you have to recognize everybody's contribution, of course. Um, enslaved people, I mean, we, we, we talk openly, we talk appreciatively ad, in admiration of enslaved people who just left, who basically ran away. Right. Uh, with nowhere to go, and I think no certain path to freedom. Um, but there are also, um, you know, hundreds of thousands who stayed, millions who stayed, um, unsure of what to do uh, and how to, where to go. And um, Lincoln and the army made that, uh, and of course the 13th Amendment, which he pushed uh, wholeheartedly, to deal with the fact that slavery remained legal, legal in the in the border states that had not rebelled, um, it's his. It's his, It's it's all he's doing from summer of eighteen sixty four until his death is ending slavery in America. To me, the most compelling person of the war, and I know we probably won't match on this, but to me, the most compelling person of the war is Grant. Ulysses S. Grant, where he came from and where he ended up, uh, how he overcame failure after failure after failure to become 
just put it this way in seven years in 1857, he had to pawn his gold watch, I think for $20 to buy Christmas presents for his family. Seven years later, he's the first merit Lieutenant general since George Washington. Mm -hmm. That's the promise of America. Grant also had, I think one of the most compelling love matches in American history, not only the civil war and that's with his wife, Julia, even in the movie Lincoln, in all the books you read, Mary Todd Lincoln comes off as just an absolute nightmare. Now she did lose a son. She lost two sons. They lost two sons. How unfair has history been to Mary Todd Lincoln? And do you think she was a net plus or a net minus with regard to Lincoln's leadership during the war? Oh, my God. You asked about five questions there. So first, I, I strongly disagree with you about Grant. I know he's all the fashion. He's very compelling. Ron Chernow likes him. But Lincoln is is the man for me. He overcame, um, you know, poverty every bit as grueling, uh, failure, uh, political failure, and business failure, too. Remember, he was bankrupt in business as well, not just Grant. I think Lincoln's the most important figure of the war, but for me, Grant is is is, is compelling okay. in a different well, way. You have serious issues to deal with. I understand that. Um, <laughs> what if I said Braxton Bragg was the most compelling member of this? Listen, it he may have been right, Braxton. Bragg. It may have, he um, he may have had a love match, but he also had a bit of a burden with Julia. I mean, Julia was a slave owner. Julia had slaves through the, the early part of the Civil War and came from. Right. A, family. So it must have been a real love match. I think it was. Um, um, and, you know, in marriage that endured separations that were much worse than what Lincoln caused by staying away weekends. They were separated for a year at one point, I think, if I remember, when uh, Grant took up posts in, in wars or even without a war when he went out west. Um, so Mary, net plus or net minus? You added too many conditions there. You said net plus or net minus in the Civil War. How about I'm just net gonna, plus or net minus? Yeah, I would say net plus. I don't think Lincoln, and I think without Lincoln, Mary would have been a wreck and you know, might have ended up institutionalized without any help from her son. <laughs> um, without Mary, I don't think Lincoln is... Um, is a success in politics. Um, I think it's it, the Robert Sherwood version is somewhat exaggerated. He didn't lack ambition. He didn't need her to push him, but she gave him, it's like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, right? Fred Astaire was a great dancer. Ginger Rogers was a good, very good dancer. Together they were magic. They made magic. And I think Link, uh, Mary was part of the power couple. She gave him creds in Whig, uh, the Whig party hierarchy. She counts, she really did counsel him. And um, he may have used her as a, 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 you know, what do you call it? A bouncing pad? No, that's not the right term. Sounding board? Sounding board, there you go. Um, during the Civil War, she's not a net plus because she has such terrible anxieties about her half brothers and brothers-in-law in Confederate service about questions about her loyalty, about how, you know, foolishly aspiring to social um, magnificence in a period when everybody's sacrificing. So, and she deteriorates, but I don't like to pile on to Mary because, um, um, I, you know, Betty Ford was addicted to alcohol and was sick, had cancer uh, during Gerald Ford's brief presidency and did not was not there for him. Remember she famously giggled when someone brought news that he had been shot or shot at by an assassin. I think yeah. there were two, two assassination attempts in three weeks by women. Mm. She laughed holding a glass of wine. Nobody was angry at Betty Ford. They realized she had a problem and she conquered it and she became the most admired woman in the world. And she started a clinic for rehabilitation named in her honor to this day. And she was enduringly popular. Um, for some reason, uh, physical 
disability and even addiction is tolerated more today than mental disability was, was tolerated in, 1860, in the 1860s. I mean, Mary had real problems uh, caused by whatever, bipolar disorder, neuroses, worse, and she was a burden. But listen, that's what a husband signs up for when he gets married, to be there for his wife. It's not just the wife being there for her husband. And all of the anti-Lincoln literature comes from guys. So I suggest people read Jean Baker or Catherine Clinton to get a different perspective on Mrs. Lincoln. We have just a few uh, minutes left on the Leaders Legends podcast with Lincoln historian Harold Holzer. So Harold Holzer has a podcast. Abraham Lincoln comes on. What are you going to ask him? Oh, I, I get that question a lot. I always, I always um, kick the can down the road about the political question. Um, and I say to him, so what it, was it with you and your father? Um, you know, because that explains a lot. I'd love to know, you know, you're under hypnosis. You've got to answer this truthfully. <laughs> Thomas Lincoln uh, is his father. <laughs> Thomas Lincoln. Um, because um, David Reynolds is now advancing the idea in his new book that uh, they weren't really as estranged as uh, people say, that uh, they had a perfectly fine relationship. Uh, and, uh, you know, I just want to know what gives with that. Did it, did it push him to be more independent? Did it push him to be not a man of the land because he hated his father's example so much? Um, so I, I would like to get to the root of that and then the other questions will flow. A philosopher famously defined a great man as someone who never reminds you of anyone else. Is there anyone who Lincoln reminds you of? Is there any leader subsequent to his time on earth that where you say, not just in the United States, but anywhere, um, you know, this guy's got a lot of, I read about him or I listen to him. I think of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, absolutely not. I mean, actors have come close. Um, the combination um, of attributes is so unique. And you talk about the global, looking through the globe for analogs, but rather than that, it's people around the globe who, who have admired Lincoln. Um, uh, Fidel Castro, unlikely people. <laughs> uh, um, uh, Gandhi and Nehru were both huge Lincoln admirers. Um, Gorbachev was a Lincoln admirer. Um, Chiang Kai-shek was a Lincoln admirer. And I'll leave it with that. If, you, if anyone ever gets to go to Taipei and visit Chiang Kai-shek's um, tomb or memorial, you will see what he thought about Abraham Lincoln because except for its pagoda-like architecture, it is the Lincoln Memorial. He wanted to be remembered as a Lincoln. He's not but he wanted to be. Um, and um, no leader has inflected what the world's view of what a humble but brilliant leader should be. What's, your favorite, I'll tell you. what's your favorite quote about Lincoln? As I would not be a slave, I would not be a master. This describes my idea of democracy. That is your favorite quote from Lincoln. Yeah, I mean, it probably isn't, but I just thought of it now, so that was my immediate reaction. <laughs> What's your favorite quote from someone else about Lincoln? Um, Tolstoy, um, which I've used and Doris Goodman has used, um, that his name is, and I'm going to not get it right, but Tolstoy, of all people, wrote that... Um, People, he, he lived as far away, you'd have to walk for 100 days to get to him, but he's known everywhere. Um, his name was Abraham Lincoln. And my favorite is the one from the aforementioned Jefferson Davis. And I think I'll get this right. Next to the destruction of the Confederacy, the death of Abraham Lincoln is the darkest day the South has ever known. That is a, a very good quote, too. Um, you have there been listening. Very few people who, very few people of reputation who expressed anything but 
anything like the kind of enmity he endured in his life. I mean, thinking about him, considering him. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the problem about doing the best quote about Lincoln is that nothing ever approaches his quotes. <laughs> Sounds like prose to describe poetry. Anyway, this, been, is, this has been fun. You have been listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel, Grand Hall, and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Our guest today has been preeminent and undisputed king of Abraham Lincoln Scholarship, Harold Holzer. You've been very generous with your time. We loved the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been great. Remember, Lincoln cautioned against the divine right of kings, so that may not be the right. Uh, I, I, I don't. I, what do he say? I don't. Uh, I don't pretend to be posted in history, but all I know about Charles the First is he lost. He lost his head. His head. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Harold. All right. Take care. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. Mm-hmm.